Good morning and welcome to South Albemarle, our Sunday School Hour. I'm Jack and we appreciate you joining with us today, some here, some online. And uh, we'll be in the book of Luke for the next 13 weeks. We just finished a study in Isaiah. We were there 13 weeks. And I hope maybe you'll take your Bible and during your quiet time or devotion time, maybe you can spend some time going ahead in your lesson, uh, our lesson series, and maybe try to complete that book in the next 13 weeks in your reading time. <clears throat> we also uh, uh, have quarterlies, if you would like one I mentioned last week, just drop a note or a card or a uh, call. Uh, it, we would be happy to get that to you. My phone number is 704-438-1955, P.O. Box at the Church at South Albemarle Baptist Church, P.O. Box 1063. Albemarle, and that zip is 28002. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get you a quarterly if you'd like one, and uh, we'll begin today. <clears throat> Again, we're in Luke, but I want to go back to Isaiah, because as we look at this today in the first chapter of the book of Luke, we're given the a calling and the birth of John the Baptist, and we talked in Isaiah how Isaiah looked ahead and gave us a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he would be born, how he would die, and we saw that, and there's also a couple of verses of Scripture that tell us about John the Baptist and his coming, and that's in chapter 40 and verse 3. Listen to this, and you'll recognize the description from the New Testament. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and every hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. That is a reference to John the Baptist coming as the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's also one other in the Old Testament I'd like to share with you, Malachi chapter 3. This is the uh, uh, last book before we get into the New Testament. And just to remind you, that 400 years from that last prophet until Luke and uh, Matthew write and the Lord Jesus Christ breaks on the scene, is 400 years of just quietness from heaven. There's no word from heaven. There's no prophet from heaven. And Malachi says in that last verse, he says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, said the Lord, whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And so we see the introduction. We see that this prophesied in the Old Testament that there would be one coming that would come before the Lord. Now, as we look at this, we begin and we start in the book of Luke. If you want to find that place in your Bibles, I need to do that myself. And uh, this first chapter, I want to read some before we get to our scripture, verse 13. It's probably easier for me just to read it to you than to tell you about it. It begins in verse 1, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they have delivered them unto us, from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order most excellent Theopolis. What Luke is introducing in his book as, he's saying that I'm writing this because we all saw it. There are many eyewitnesses, and I want to write it, and I want to put it in the order that it came in. And I'm so glad that he did, and I'm glad God preserved it as part of his word. And he says that thou might knowest the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Now, as we begin to look at this scripture passage today, we know we're looking at the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to read some preparation before we get into our scripture to help you understand how this came about. There were in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abijah, and his wife was the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. We're given a little bit about their character. We're given a little bit about what they do. And it tells us in verse 7, and they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they were both 
well stricken in years. And so we see the situation that this couple faces. They remind us of, of Abraham that they were unable to have children and it's late in life and God is going to bless them with this child. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. I want to stop here because this is important. This burning of incense, they drew lots to see who was going to do that. At this time, it was estimated there were 18,000 priests who served just like Zechariah in the temple. And there was only one time in your lifetime that you could go in to burn incense. And it happened at this day that he drew and he was the one that was allowed to enter. You could only do it one time in your life and many priests never got to do it because of the number of priests that were there. And the whole multitude of people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. <coughs> As we think about this, this prayer, there are many believe that this was probably a two, twofold prayer. That is, he has had for a long time a prayer about a child for he and his wife, but also the job that he did as priest, he would be praying for the Messiah to come, for the deliverance of Israel. That's what that priest was all about and what his job was. I believe this was a twofold answer to both of those prayers by the birth of John. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many, many rejoice at his birth. Many are because he's going to help fulfill the plan of the redemption of Israel. Now, as we get into it, if you've got your quarterly, verse 13 is where we're at, and we see that, and we'll kind of begin a little more discussion about it. The angel says to him, fear not. I believe that prayer was a prayer of the, uh, that God is going to send him a son, <clears throat> but in answering that prayer, he's going to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. God is, Israel has been praying for a long time for the Messiah that was promised to them, and God is ready to deliver on that promise. The time is here, the time is right, and his name is going to be called John. Look at verse 14. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. As we look at this, we're told a little bit about the mission and what he is going to accomplish. One, there are going to be many that are going to be excited about John the Baptist's birth. And they're going to be because they know it ushers in the Messiah. And they know that God is about to bring deliverance and salvation to his people. Now, as we think and we begin to get to this point in our study, we were studying in the Old Testament and we studied about the people of God. And we were primarily talking about those people of Israel that were in a covenant relationship with Him. We talked one lesson about that covenant, that that was a covenant that was made with Abraham. But when you come to the New Testament and Jesus took the Lord's Supper, He said, this is the new covenant that He's making with us. And it's based on His death. It's based on His blood and the shedding of His blood for our sins and the redemption that we receive. And so as we begin to see that from kind of here out, my people are going to be those who come to Jesus Christ and confess their sins and receive Him as Savior. You see, I'm glad as a Gentile, I'm not a Jew. We're Gentiles. I'm glad that that door was opened up by the Lord Jesus Christ to include everybody. And that verse in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that whosoever would come to Him can come and be a part. You begin to see that when Christ came, 
he, uh, all through his lifetime, they had problems with him with certain people. The Samaritan woman was one that comes to mind. And they didn't understand why Jesus took the time to minister and to meet her needs. But Jesus was opening that door so that uh, he was the Messiah of the whole world and not the, just that of the Jews. Notice something else about him. He, he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He's talking about the Nazarite vow that you're probably more familiar with that Samson took. Samson was not to uh, drink any strong drink. He was not to ever cut his hair. And he was not supposed to be in the presence of anything, uh, a, a dead person. And so as you think about that, that was a Nazarite vow. And it was a setting aside of that person for the work of the Lord. We know how Samson was given great opportunities. We know his great victories. And we know his terrible defeats in his personal life that he had. But we see that vow that John is going to be making. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Something important about the Holy Spirit. Do you remember when the Holy Spirit came at the day of Pentecost? It came and it fell upon them. And we believe as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, after the death of Christ, after the day of Pentecost, when we are saved, we receive the Holy Spirit <coughs> in our heart and life. He guides us, he directs us. But prior to Pentecost, there was not an infilling of the Holy Spirit. If you read in the Old Testament, it will tell you about a prophet. It will tell you about Samson or some other. It will say, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The task was given, and then God gave his Spirit to allow that person to do sometimes miraculous things. And we are told here that he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. John is called for a task to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going to be given the power and the authority and the, the, the things that he needs in his life by the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 16. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before them in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and to the disobedient, to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now let's stop and think for a minute about John. What did John preach? Well, most people would say John was a hellfire brimstone preacher. He preached about repentance. He talked to the people of Israel, and he said he was out in the wilderness. And it's interesting that he was preaching in the wilderness, and people were coming. In fact, the Bible tells us that people from the temple went out there to see what in the world he was preaching about. The common people of that day came, and John the Baptist had his audience of those ordinary working people and and as he preached that delegation that came out there that day he preached repentance he said you need to turn from your sins and he preached that Israel had sinned against God and that they needed to repent and there was going to be one that was going to come and bring salvation and that was his message and that's what he was called to do and look at this and to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people for the Lord. He is going to preach about repentance and he's going to do all those things. And my, one of my favorite passages in the New Testament, you remember when John was baptizing and John was baptizing not in the temple, he was baptizing out in the river and he would baptize them and he was immersing them in the water. And you remember that day that Jesus came up and Jesus wanted to be baptized. And as Jesus approached, John the Baptist held up and pointed to Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. What was he saying that day? He was saying, Isaiah has talked about somebody that was going to die for our sins. And there is the lamb. They were familiar with the lamb that would be brought to a sacrifice. They would slay that animal and burn it on the altar, sprinkle the blood, and it was done for a sacrifice for their sin. John is the first one that points at Jesus and say, that's God's lamb that is going to wash away your sins. That was his message message of repentance. And you would think that they would hear and understand. Well, many people did repent of their sins. And if you study in the 
early parts of the Gospels, John the Baptist had his disciples, Jesus had his disciples, and, and they kind of went separate ways. And Jesus said about John the Baptist, there's not a greater than John the Baptist. There's not a greater one than him. And, you know, as we study about him, it, it, he's just a just fulfill the calling of his life that the Lord had for him. Well, let's go to this next verse. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereabouts shall I know this? For I am old, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that standeth in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. Now this is interesting. Uh, an angel appears before him. He identifies himself as Gabriel. He says, I'm still the one that ministers unto the Lord in heaven. And by the way, there are only two angels by names mentioned in the Bible, this one, and Michael the archangel. You'll find him in Revelation. But uh, he says unto him, he says, I've come and you're asking for a sign? How much more of a sign do you need? You know, how, how can you ask for a sign? And Gabriel is just... Uh, he, he tells him, you know, I'm sent from God. That's about as good as it's going to get. And he says in this, in verse 20, And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words. I kind of think the angel might have looked at, at Zechariah and said, you know, maybe you better just keep your mouth shut about what's going on. You're going to mess it up. So he was dumb and he was not able to speak. He was not able to communicate the fact of what was going to happen. I don't know if that's by God's plan or design, but I know that God did that. And as we look at it, we see that Zechariah is just overwhelmed by what the news he has heard. He is, he's happy, but he's skeptical like all of us. And, you know, it's, he's been a priest. He's been there. He's prayed that prayer. And when his, God has answered his prayer, he just don't seem to be able to believe it. And the last part of this verse, Because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. You know, there's a miraculous birth about John because his parents were old. The angel appears and announces it. And then John the Baptist is here and he announces the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see it from the Old Testament. The Old Testament got two big fingers pointed to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And over and over those prophecies were given. And I'm so glad we studied Isaiah before this because it pointed the way 700 years. And no wonder there was such joy and happiness when the Lord finally heard and answered their prayer. Verse 21, And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. This was his one time in a lifetime to burn incense. This was a day, and when he went back there, he was gone for a long time, folks. And they began to wonder, those that were waiting outside. Verse 22, And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. They didn't know what happened, but they took for granted that maybe he had seen a vision and God had spoken to him in some way and he was unable to speak. Verse 23, And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. After this encounter with Gabriel, the angel, and the news and his unable to speak, he serves his term, he finishes the duties that he's called to do as a priest, and then he departs home. They would go to the temple and they'd be there for a period of time, and they were on a rotation, and when his time was up and he accomplished his duty as a priest, then he returned home. And look at the last verse, verse 24 and 25. And after these days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself for five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. I think most of us know the time and the culture that they lived in. Children were a blessing. They needed them to survive. They needed them to work the land, to farm, and to do all of those things. And uh, when a couple was without child, many times folks thought they had done something wrong. 
And there was a reproach that this society had put on her. And Elizabeth is happy because she says, The Lord has taken that away. He's answered my prayer, and he's given me a child, and he's given me a son, and he's called him for a purpose. And what a wonderful thing. What a, what a blessing this story is to us. As we think about this a minute and we think about John the Baptist, there's not much more given to us about John the Baptist in the Bible. I kind of gave you a couple of ideas of how he preached in the wilderness. We're told that. But uh, one day the king had a big feast. And you'll read this in, a little later in the scripture. And he had a, a, a wife and she had a daughter. And that daughter, Herodias, the, and, and the daughter, they had that party and she danced for the king. And the king said, uh, you did such a good job. I'm going to give you any wish that you want in the kingdom. And she confided with her mother, and they came up with this. I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. That's what I want. And John the Baptist, at a very young age, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, you'll find that uh, they brought him in, they cut his head off, and they brought it in and put it on a platter. And that was his call. That was his mission. And Jesus said about John the Baptist, many would look at that and they would say, sounds like a failure to me. Just got started in his work and had his head cut off. That don't sound like fun to me. But Jesus said there's none greater than John the Baptist. And when you think about that, what it really says to us is John the Baptist fulfilled the calling for which God had for him. And that's the greatest thing that any of us can do is to fulfill and to take advantage of the opportunities that God places before us to serve him, to love him, to worship him, to be with him. And, and when we do that, we fulfill the highest calling of our life. I think so many times we get mixed up today by the world's view of success and the real view of success. Our world measures it by how much money, how many assets, how many stocks, your portfolio, what you got. And God measures it a different way. He measures it by faithfulness and love to him. And John the Baptist, you know, it would have been easy to stop preaching. It would have been easy to stop doing the things that God had called him to do. I kind of think John the Baptist knew that he is stirring up a lot of trouble. When they sent that delegation out from the temple to listen to John the Baptist and to hear what he was preaching, it was a sign that there is trouble that's on the way. And John the Baptist was faithful to the Lord. As we think about this story and we're leading into the coming of Jesus and in the next few verses we'll read about Mary and her conception and how Jesus was sent. I want you to always remember about the Christmas story. It's a wonderful thing. We share love, we share gifts and I, I love Christmas as much as anybody. But the Lord Jesus Christ, his purpose was not to be in a manger and to be worshipped. His purpose in his life was come and to die for our sins. He loved us. He shed his blood for us. And all the way through the Old Testament, it pictures that our sin has to be paid for. That God will not dismiss our sin, but he will forgive our sins. And he does it by payment of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we look at the Christmas story and enjoy this time of the year, we're all reminded of what a debt we owe our Savior for what he did for us. He brought us into a relationship with him. He gives us purpose. He gives us meaning. He gives us our life here. He's promised us a life after we leave here. And what Christ has done, folks, we ought to celebrate at Christmas time. Uh, he's, he is a good Savior, isn't he? He's good all the time, and all the time he's good, isn't he? But let's bow for our prayer today. Lord, we just thank you and praise you that you loved us enough to come and face the consequences of the cross. And we're so glad that you had the power that that grave couldn't hold you. And we're glad that you made a promise for us that if, as you live, we're going to live also. And that you've gone to prepare a place for us. And that you're going to come back one day so that we might be with you. I pray that you'll help us just to ponder this Christmas season and be reminded of our calling in our life and the reason that you gave us life and the purpose that you've given us and the calling of our life and how well we're fulfilling what you've called us to do. I pray we'd examine that and take an inventory of that and make the changes that we need in our life. And I pray that you just help us to enjoy that fellowship and love and that relationship that you have with us. I pray that we wouldn't be so busy, not just at Christmas time, but every day we would make sure that we have time to meditate on you, 
pray to you, and to fellowship and enjoy the presence of the Lord in our life. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us. I thank you for making that sacrifice for sin that we could not do ourselves. We just praise you and love you and thank you today for all you've done. We ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.